And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, where the NBA season is over. And in what is becoming a disturbingly regular tradition for the rest of the NBA, hopping on for his first extended post-championship interview, head coach of the now three-time champion, at least in this iteration, Golden State Warriors, Steve Kerr. How you doing? I am fantastic. How you doing, Zach? I bet you are fantastic. You should be. It's over. It's a, <laughs> it's a long season, huh? It is over. Thank God it's over. Man, what a long haul. But, um, yeah, it all uh, it all ended perfectly, and I think we're all excited for summer. Um, what? Uh, so you guys win in Cleveland for the second time, um, and but their carpeting does not take the champagne well. That carpet is disgusting when you guys get oh, through with gone. it. it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, there was like a river in there. It was much worse than I remembered it uh, the last couple of years. Uh, and then you go to a local restaurant to celebrate, and you were there for a long, long time. Um, what are your? You know, last year we talked about some of the conversations you had, some of your memories from from the the post title fun. What are you going to take with you? Was there a conversation? Was there someone you took aside? Was there just a moment, a funny moment that you'll that you'll sort of take with you from that? I imagine it's quite a haze. It is a haze, but there was uh, well, there was lots. There was there was lots that uh, went on that was memorable. I'll, I'll share one with, one with you. Was uh, smoking cigars outside of Morton's um, in Cleveland, you know, at about four o'clock in the morning, and Charles Oakley showing up, and Charles and Draymond Green were in a big uh, argument over. Um, how the Knicks would have guarded the pick and roll. At least that was my understanding of their conversation. It was quite animated. So I told Charles, uh, feel free to go at him. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always glad when somebody else is in an argument with Draymond rather than me. <laughs> I feel like you had a smoking cigars outside Morton's story with Steph Curry two years ago. This one is better. So Charles Oakley just rolls into the party? Well, you know he's a Cleveland guy. He's from there. That's right. And uh, I believe he was at the game and um you know there's a big bash going on and yeah so charles wandering by and in he came and uh you know it was great to see uh Tremont and Jen oak going at it heatedly over uh cigars and cocktails and uh, i think the rest of the group that was hovering around all enjoyed it as well there are rumors about Clay Thompson's dancing performance at Morton's. Maybe tabletop dancing. Can you confirm or deny this? I mean, Clay is just oh, the best. I love yeah. Clay so much. Clay is the best. China Clay came out. I guess we'll call him Cleveland Clay uh, in this case. But he was he was out in full force. Uh, I think the MVP of the party might have been Mike Brown. Um, Mike was the guy who got the dance floor going. <laughs> inside of Morton's. I, I, that didn't happen a few years ago when we celebrated there. This time, full full on dance floor, Mike going nuts. Uh, Zaza Pachulia, also an MVP candidate for the party. Um, I told him, I said, I, 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 I didn't know how he had that stamina to dance for an hour straight when I hadn't even played him in like two months. Well, maybe that's why. I, I was going to say, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's why. Um, maybe that's why. A lot of pent up energy. Uh, Did he, no, those those moments you just can't ever reenact. It's just such a raw, powerful sense of joy and emotion and and uh, relief and all of the above. And those first few hours, I think anybody who's won a championship would tell you those first few hours after the final buzzer, um, there there's nothing like it. Um, Zaza appeared to have like a, a large group of Georgians um, accompanying him, yeah. like Georgia, the country Georgians accompanying him around. It, it, that's who they were. I did not. I did not have time or space to ask who they were. Yes, uh, the real Georgia, as, as uh, Zaza called. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah. He's uh, as you know, he's quite a popular figure in his native land, and uh, I want to say, yeah, there were at least ten or twelve. Georgians uh, in the party uh, celebrating with Zaza. They were at the game, too. It wasn't just at the party. I'm glad you brought up Mike yeah. Brown because in your infamous Steph Curry birthday dance, which I believe you have blamed on Heineken, um, an otherwise, you know, <laughs> an otherwise reputable beverage, uh, right. Mike Brown was the real MVP. He just, he got overshadowed for his dance performance in that video. 
Um, uh, I assume there's some video of Steve Kerr dancing at this party. There has to be, right? Or there's the, if there's not video, this, this happened. It's 2018. Yeah. Zach, of, of course there's a video. Did Big you, Brother's watching. Did you improve? Time. Did you improve your performance? No, I'm still, I still got dad moves, unfortunately. Well, you're a dad. Um, That's true. I was told by one of your closest confidants on the team um, that the champagne drenching of you in the locker room, you're probably not even going to want to talk about this, but that that, that the uh, sort of an inner circle of people when you walked in got you in a huddle and drenched you in champagne and that it struck this guy is, is sort of even more emotional than your typical sort of champagne spraying. That he said, ask Steve about the champagne sort of huddle or whatever. Is, do you do you have yeah. any idea what I'm referring to? Oh yeah, of course. You know it's uh, you know as you as the players are beginning their celebration, you know it's, it's it seems like everybody sort of gets their individual dowsing, you know, and so one after one after another, guys are going into the middle of the of the huddle and everybody's opening up a new bottle and just, you know, spraying champagne all over that guy. And, uh, so I had my turn and uh, I, I think I was the last one in there. I was out on the floor doing media or something and walked in there and just got destroyed. And it was awesome. It was so great. And what my favorite memory of that actually is, uh, from Steph Curry. So during the season, every once in a while, I share, uh, a thought with the guys, which is, um, and I quote, uh, there's a reason we pour champagne on each other at the end of the season, right? Because it's really hard, you know. I mean, and I, I probably pull that line out a few times a year, you know, during our, during a losing streak or a, an injury or tough time. I just go, it's just a reminder, like, this is supposed to be hard, you know, it is hard, and there's a reason we pour champagne on each other. And so uh, when when I got into that huddle and the players all started spraying me, Steph, being the wise ass that he is, he's, he's yelling at me, you know why I'm pouring champagne on you? Because this is hard, coach. This is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Steph never lets anything get by him. He always holds everything in that in that uh, brain of his, and he brings it back around. No, I could have said something like four years ago, he would have brought it back around. Speaking of injuries – it's over now. Um, the season is over now. How serious was Clay's injury, and how worried you were you after Game One, going into Game Two, um, that either he might not be able to play, he might not be able to play the rest of the series, or he's going to be so limited that like, do we have a backup plan in place if he if he goes in the game and we got to pull him after two minutes? Mm-hmm. I was. I didn't think he was going to play Game Two. Uh... And what I was hoping for at that point, when I saw him the day before game two, I didn't think he'd be able to play. His ankle's black and blue and swollen, and he's limping everywhere in the training room. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how he's going to be able to play at that point. And um, so my thought was at least there's two, two off days before game three. So I was hopeful that he would just be able to get out there for game three and get, and, you know, get back in the series at that point. But, uh, you know, he made a remarkable recovery, and he's he's got so much tolerance for pain that uh, he got out there for game two and had a great game and, and then kind of went through the exact same process uh, over again um, while, while, while we were at Cleveland before both games three and four, limping everywhere the day before, but then, you know, just playing on adrenaline and emotion uh, and, and getting it done. Does he even verbalize anything? Does he say, I'm in pain, this is how much pain I'm in, I can't move left or I can't move right? Or is he just like, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm going to play? Does, does, do, do, can you have a dialogue with him about it? No, not really. It's just, I'm all right, no, I'm all right, I'll be able to play. And as he's saying that, he's like limping heavily. And, you know, you you, you just want to ask, well, how, how are you possibly going to play looking like that? But... Um, He's just a machine. He's he just plays through everything, and this was a particularly bad one for him. He hasn't had a lot of injuries uh, over the course of his career, but this was a bad one, and uh, he he got through it. The guy's the guy's incredible. His low maintenance steadiness is just it's 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 unbelievable. I, I may have told this story on the podcast before, but my one of my favorite Clay being Clay stories, and there are so many. But this is it, Cleveland and Champagne got me remembering it. Is when you guys won the first year in Cleveland, 
Clay just wanted to get out of the arena and walk over to Morton's, but he wanted he, and he didn't want to change. He just wanted to walk in his jersey as, <laughs> as Clay Thompson through downtown Cleveland, and every, people on the team had to be like, "Clay, you can't, you can't just go out as Clay Thompson in your jersey." You're, this first of all, it's a hostile territory. Second of all, you're an internationally famous. Um, in your <laughs> but nothing will ever beat the scaffolding. Nothing. So when yeah, you did the team bad. make a joke out of that? Did that make it into a film edit? I know you put things in film edits. I mean, that is like it's too good. It's too good to be real. Almost. He is so funny. Um, in in a very subtle way. I mean, he's got a wicked sense of humor, but he's also incredibly quiet. So when he does say something or do something, it, it takes on even more humor uh, because of the way he carries himself. But that was, yeah, that was one of my all-time favorites. And and I happened to be watching uh, the news that night with Margot. My wife was in, in on the road trip with us in New York. And it wasn't, you know, one of those things where it was like, hey, did you see this on the uh, on the Internet? Like somebody posted this thing with Clay. Like we actually were watching the news and – I was in shock. I was like, wait, what? What just happened? <laughs> but typical Clay, he's got like kind of a uh, perverse sense of humor and, and he just pulls it out when, you know, when, when that humor out when, uh, when it strikes him to do so. And it's like, oh my God, this guy's hysterical. He had elite thoughts on scaffolding. I mean, detailed that there's probably, there's probably like two minutes of footage that they had to cut because it was too long to, to fit. He, he was really <laughs> passionate about the scaffolding. Um, Spe- speaking of injuries, um, did you guys have any idea about LeBron? No, no, um, didn't have any any clue, and um, kind of caught me off guard at the uh, you know after the last game when people started coming up in- to me and telling me he was in a cast and all that. So yeah, he- they kept it quiet. What would you have done had you known? I don't. I don't strike you. Now you can't control what Draymond is going to do, but I don't. You don't strike me rather as the kind of coach who's like, let's be physical with them. Let's let's reach in and hit the wrist or something like that. Could, would you force him right? Was there anything you could have done if <laughs> had you known, played him to take jumpers no. more? I guess. Yeah, maybe. maybe um, I guess maybe you 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 know play him play off him a little bit, thinking if you if you've got a hurt hand, then it's going to be harder to shoot. But uh, you know nothing, uh, nothing sinister. That's for sure. I mean, you don't do anything like that. But you just sort of uh, maybe you react with a scouting report. But I don't know. I still would have expected him to make shots anyway. Did you? Did you? I mean, he he essentially stopped shooting jumpers, which obviously you notice. And and I wonder what did you chalk it up to? Well, maybe he's tired, maybe because of all the demands on him, or is the game such a blur that you don't even even almost notice that kind of stuff? You're talking about game four. Game three and four, he kind of like the jumper. Just, I mean, at the end of game three, he started taking jumpers again that looked to me out of fatigue. But the, his jumper was clearly not with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't quite right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I was aware that because after game one, when he made all those threes and he had fifty one points, it's like, you know, this guy's a whole different deal now um, from what he was even like four years ago, and. Um, so you have to prepare a little bit differently. You got to be ready for him to shoot more and all that. And then I was definitely aware in the last game that he it just looked like he didn't want to shoot, but we didn't know why. Um that was wild. Uh so you saw Bill Simmons lurking around the finals, I assume, right? Oh yeah, of course. He's yeah. got his uh his HBO show. So he yanked me onto that. Um, before game four. I mean, this is the, I, mean, I didn't have time to ask ESPN PR or anything. He's like, hey, you're coming over here. Let's go on the show. He's my old boss. I'm going to do it. Um, and he's, we're, we're having a, like a, what I consider a normal conversation about, um, just the finals, legacy, who's going to win finals, MVP, all the stuff you talk about. And then out of nowhere, he says, hey, have you heard the rumor that LeBron has a broken hand? So this, this is going to be on TV. You're going to see me looking like a moron on television, like three hours before game four, because I'm, I said, what? No. What? That's, crazy that's insane and then yeah. and after the game we fought lo and behold he heard something from somebody well um i don't know where he heard it and uh like i said first i i heard of it was after game four and uh the, the whole press conference with the brace on his wrist and all that stuff and um you know it's uh it was it, it was bizarre i mean i don't remember any ever hearing anything like that in the past um 
as the opposing coach in the middle of an ultra competitive um, atmosphere, what is your first reaction or what is your staff's reaction to the video that comes out of LeBron in the huddle after um, whatever it is that J.R. Smith did and all of that? Did, do you all, did you watch it? Did you watch the whole thing? I did. I did. I watched it. Um, unremarkable. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, if people think that they they should have expected to see him going, you know, hey, it's okay, guys, let's we're going to win this. Like that's not how it works. I mean, you know, it's it's not a Hollywood movie. You know, um, in every huddle, there's all kinds of angst and anger, and you know, um, there, there's emotion, and it's uh, so none of that surprised me. I mean, that's that's probably what our huddle would have looked like too. Do you remember the first thing you said, who, whoever it was to, after the buzzer sounded at the end of regulation, and you had time to digest what had just happened and what what Jr. had just? I mean, I, I watched that play fifteen times because I, I wanted to see everyone on the Warriors bench reaction to it. And I nominated, by the way, Chris Chris DeMarco as the funniest reaction of everybody on the whole staff. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and watch. What it. What did he do? I didn't even notice. He he. Um, first, well, he, I, he has a double reaction when, when KD fails to box, well, JR gets the rebound. He, he like raises his hands in, in panic and confusion over how anyone had allowed this to happen. And then when right. JR begins dribbling to half court, he kind of raises his hands above his head. It just, it was like he had lost control of it, his facial expressions. <laughs> and then the buzzer sounds. And if I'm remembering right, he just sort of, he with both his hands in the air, then slaps his own head with both hands, one on each side of his head. It w- it was like he couldn't; his limbs didn't know what to do, but they had to do something because it was so crazy. So, what do you remember about like? I don't know who the first guy you talked to is in in, in a typical huddle. If it's Q, if it's if it's JC, I don't know. Right. No, my um, my reaction. If you look at me on the sidelines, I'm holding my hands up in the air. Because I was really, really concerned that Clay might have thought, based on Jr.'s reaction, I thought Clay was going to go foul him. And if you watch the replay, you know Clay is kind of chasing after him. And I don't know if you remember this, but like eight or nine years ago, there was one of the most bizarre plays in NBA history where somebody shot at the wrong hoop. Which you know maybe that happens once every couple of years, like somebody shoots at the wrong hoop. But on this particular play. The other team got equally confused, and so on the shot that was going to the other hoop, the defender actually fouled the guy, and then the refs called a foul. I don't, do you remember I, this? I don't remember this. I have no memory of this. Yeah. I want to say it was like eight or maybe eight or ten years ago, and I wish I could remember the details, but that's what I was thinking about because as soon as J.R. grabs the rebound and he races to half court, Clay starts chasing him, and I haven't had a chance to talk to Clay. You know, I never went to him afterwards and said, "Hey, did you, you know, did you know exactly what was going on?" Because it looked to me like Clay was going to try to grab him. So I'm holding my hands up in the air, like, "Don't foul! Don't foul! Don't foul!" And uh, luckily, he doesn't. And um, and then we're going to overtime. Then I'm smiling, like, "Man, we got away with with murder." What's the dumbest thing you ever did as a player in a game? Oh, it's not even close. I, I tipped the ball back on a Christmas night game. We were up three against the Knicks in Chicago, and the Knicks threw a home run pass because they were out of timeouts, and I went up to catch it, and I tried to throw it back to a teammate because I thought the guy behind me, it might have been Derek Harper, I thought maybe he was going to get the ball. But – I, I went up and tried to tip it back to a teammate and went right to Hubert Davis, and he made a three at the buzzer, and the game went to overtime. It's the biggest biggest bonehead gaff of my career, and it happened to be on Christmas, so they play the damn thing on every Christmas on NBA TV, and I have to <laughs> relive my moment. <laughs> uh, does Michael take that well? Yeah, we... Uh, I don't think we've talked about that. I don't. That might have been the year he was gone. Oh, I okay. Hope it was. Okay. <laughs> it was for me, for my sake, <laughs> I think that was. I think he was gone that year, so that worked out better for me that way. <laughs> 
Hey everyone, you know I like anything that saves me time and mental effort in buying tickets for sporting events or concerts or comedy shows or whatever used to be one of those things that just took up too much of both. And that was before SeatGeek. SeatGeek has solved all the problems of checking a million different sites on the secondary market and being worried you're getting a bad deal or wondering if you're getting a good deal. SeatGeek is the smartest and easiest way to get tickets for every type of live event. They collate the entire secondary market in one place so you can search one place instead of 19. They have an easy color-coded graphic system that tells you if this is a good deal, a bad deal, an undermarket price, an obstructed view seat, where exactly it is in the arena. They can help you get deals for any kind of event you could dream of, including Broadway shows. They help me get tickets to Hamilton, of all things. Every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop on SeatGeek with confidence. It should be your go-to app for finding the best deals on every type of ticket. It takes something that used to take an hour and makes it 30 seconds. And best of all, my listeners, get $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. All you have to do is download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code LOW, L-O-W-E. That's my last name of the name of this podcast, promo code LOW. Boom, $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. The Houston series is going to be the one that people remember more than the finals um, because you were down 3-2. And, and you faced a team that was designed to play against you and got you out of your rhythm a little bit. And, um, you know, you said after game five, you lose game five. That was the game where, where like Draymond fell over, um, in the last seconds, right? That was that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. so you lose that one, um, in fairly heartbreaking fashion. You're down three, two, un- unprecedented territory. You're facing elimination, blah, blah, blah. You come out of the press conference and say, I feel great. I feel optimistic. And some of your coaches and you have since explained, you know, we figured some things out on offense that we think are going to, Carry over. Ethan Strauss reports after the finals that you all even predicted you were going to win six straight games to close the season, which I have to say is ballsy. Um, well, no, it wasn't ballsy at all because I told Ethan that privately. I didn't, I said not for quote, but I think we're going to win six in a row. And so if you don't say it to the public, it's definitely not ballsy. I guess, I guess. Still, <laughs> I, I, to have that, I get, but you let him publish it afterwards, obviously, or else he wouldn't have published yeah. it, but. Um, yeah, but only because it made me look good. Okay, well, <laughs> I guess I'm not the coach of the Golden State Warriors, a team that won 73 games and has Kevin Durant on all of this. I'm, I'm a more of a warrior than that. So, as you know, I'm, I'm been thinking a lot about Kevin Durant, um, for a long time in these playoffs and that Houston series obviously put him in the spotlight a little bit. And I, and I asked everyone I could ask, like, what was that series like? Um, was there some sort of big players only meeting where they had to confront KD about the ISOs or confront each other about what was going wrong? Was there a crisis in confidence? And everyone's like, yeah, no, like, no, like Kate, like Rich Kleiman, KD's advisor, business advisor, agent, everything told me, yeah, KD and I just went home after game five, went to the hotel and got room service. Like nothing, like there was nothing big. I mean, so really that's what it was. It was that calm. It was. And, and I think, um, the reason is that, um, we knew first of all, that we were good enough to do it. And it was really about kind of figuring out how we could attack Houston's defense. I thought they deserve, they deserved a ton of credit for turning us into an ISO team. Um, and as you said, you know, they've been planning for this for the last couple of years. Uh, the personnel they added uh, was perfect for their scheme. Uh, I think Mike D'Antoni and Jeff Bizdelic did a great job in terms of uh, really learning you know, about how we attack in those situations, you know, how you how we have attacked switching in the past and taking away some of the little things. And we had to figure out some some ways to uh, to free our guys up and, and they had to figure out ways to free themselves up. So it was all kind of a process. That's what makes a great series great is that um you know there's there's a lot of strategic changes and ebbs and flows and and that one included the two the two big ones, which were Andre's injury and then Chris Paul's injury. And um, so you throw all that together, um, and it was a slog. And, and Kevin is the one guy uh, who can always get you a shot no matter what. And so he was busy doing that. And in the meantime, we just didn't look like ourselves and like what everybody has gotten used to seeing from us. And uh, ironically, he ends up taking – the blame for all these ISOs, but Houston was forcing us into that. And um, I think we finally broke through in uh, in game six and got better shots and uh, had better flow. 
But I give Houston the credit. I mean, they were making us take difficult shots, and they had they had a great scheme and the right personnel to, to follow through with it. Is there any kernel of truth to the idea that there's – that? You know, even though you guys have won two straight championships rather easily, um, that there is sort of an inherent stylistic tension between the way Steph plays and the way KD plays, or do you feel like um, the tension is sort of part of the point of it, and you guys have generally figured it out? I, I wouldn't say we've figured it out. I, I would say there is uh, stylistic tension, but not personal tension. You know, I, I think it's more. Like, we have to figure this out. It's not like anybody's pointing the finger or blaming one another. Um, you know, Avery Johnson used to have an expression he would use all the time, same thing, make you laugh, make you cry, you know, and, and uh, that's that's the truth. If you want to have the best ISO player on earth, then you got to live with some ISOs when maybe you don't want them, you know. And, and uh, so the luxury of having KD bail us out of possessions is occasionally going to lead to a stagnant offense when we're seeing a defense that is doing a good job against us. And uh, so I wa- there wasn't anything, you know, emotionally that was bothering us. It was more we got to figure this out strategically. And um, and I think we did. And obviously, you know, Chris Paul's injury really hurt them. Um, Andre's injury uh, really hurt us before that and kind of helped Houston get back in the series. And then, uh, you know, last the last two games, you know, Houston had leads in both games. They played really well, but I thought they wore down, and I thought our talent just took over both Steph and KD. Uh, and uh, Game 7 were just incredible in the second half. What's the locker room at halftime of Game 7 like? Every team has their halftime routines. Yours has been written about extensively because of what you do in the third quarter. I mean – what what was different about Game Seven in Houston? You guys had, had played at such a bad first quarter that you got out of that David Aldridge interview as fast as you could <laughs> between quarters. <laughs> I did. Um, I you had a million. I felt bad for David. Well, you know it's Game uh, Seven, man. I think I'm sure. He yeah. Was, so so you walk in, or maybe you walk in later than usual. I don't know. What's that locker room like? What do you remember about it? Well, what, what was what was different was um, I had I could never remember a game where we had played that poorly in the first half. And this was the most important game of the season. And so I was more than anything, I was sort of in shock. I didn't know what the hell was going on because it wasn't just, you know, we're playing really hard, but we're missing shots. We weren't even playing that hard. We weren't boxing out. PJ Tucker got every single offensive board. We were turning the ball over like crazy. And I guess in retrospect, it was just nerves. But it, 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 I thought we were beyond that, you know, given the, the two championships we had already won the last few years and the veteran players we had out on the floor. So I was kind of bewildered at what I was seeing, uh, but the message was the same as it always is, which is, you know, hey, we got a whole half to figure this out. We're only down 11. That's two or three minutes for us if we get a few stops. And uh, And we reminded the guys of, you know, the game plan and the keys and that, you know, especially without Chris out there, part of part of the game plan is to wear out Houston and you just play every possession, knowing that you know James is going to have to make a ton of plays and and Eric Gordon as well. And I really thought our defense could could save us in the second half, but we had to get some semblance of order out there on the floor offensively, and um, all that stuff came together. But I I had no idea who I was looking at that first half. It did feel I wasn't at that game. Uh, it it did feel that I, I liked that you said you had to get some order because it did feel like the game was just slipping out of control um, between the turnovers, like Draymond yelling at KD a few times, which I realized that happens, um, and the, all the offensive rebounds. Like um, it it just didn't feel normal. It felt like it was slipping away, but it doesn't seem like you were worried about the whole game slipping away. But it was a weird feeling even through TV. Uh, absolutely. It was a weird feeling for us too. Um, we, we just lost our poise and that was surprising to me. And, uh, I, like I said, I think guys were trying a little too hard and we were turning it over. Um, but then, you know, the lack of focus uh, on the glass was just driving us crazy. You know, nobody was boxing out and they were running in, getting second, third opportunities. And, 
those were, you know, some of our keys right from, you know, game one on. And here was game seven. You're supposed to have that part figured out at least. You know, you you might not make shots, but, you know, you should be dialed in. And we were not dialed in. So pretty disconcerting. But then uh, that display of shooting in the second half, both Steph and KD made some insane shots. Nick Young, I, I thought, hit maybe the biggest shot of the game, um, kind of mid-third quarter when Clay was in foul trouble and um, I think cut it to three or something, and it just felt like we had all the, all the momentum from then on. I forgot about Clay's foul trouble. That was a, he had three fouls in like four minutes. That just he's never in foul trouble. And then he got in foul trouble again the other night. Yeah, yeah, and um, it surprised me. You know, I, I'm always of the mindset to let guys play through foul trouble because if you sit them, sometimes they lose their rhythm and it sort of, you know, they might as well be on the bench with three fouls if they're on the bench with two, you know, and they're not playing and you're waiting for something. Uh, but but that philosophy, you you have to be able to count on the player to not pick up the silly one. And Clay's third one, he jumped right into Harden, fouled him on the three-point shot, and uh, it was just sort of mind-boggling. I remember I, went, I didn't see the play very clearly, and I went to Scott Foster during the timeout, and uh, I said, Scott, was it that bad? And he goes, Steve, I had to call it. I mean, it wasn't even close. He just ran him over. Um, and uh, I saw on the tape, I go, man, Scott was right. I mean, you have you have no choice but to call that foul. And uh, so three right away, and we're turning it over. And, man, it was, we were all out of sorts. Anyone out of the ordinary speak in that, in that locker room at, at halftime? No, no. It was actually pretty calm. Um you know, I think the main message from us and maybe, you know, maybe Draymond, probably Draymond, Andre, um, you know, just reminding the guys that 11 points is a is not much of a deficit, even at halftime um, of an NBA game. It's a long haul, especially for us. We got, you know, so much shot making and uh, and defense. So I, I knew that we could get back in it, but we had to get right. And uh, fortunately, we did. Um we were talking about KD before and, and the ISOs and all that. You know, uh, reading all of the post game, post season, really coverage on the way back from Cleveland the other day, just downloading it all on my phone, reading it. Um, Anthony Slater had a great piece about you and your coaching style and how you navigated um, the sort of you know the injuries, the apathy, the the what you warned me before the season. You probably remember warning me before the season that this mm-hmm. was going to be tougher than I thought it was going to be. Um, and the win total would not be where I thought it would be. Um, Anthony almost had a throwaway. It wasn't even a sentence. It was like a, a, a clause within a sentence about a, a lunch that you and Kevin had in Portland to, I think the word he used was reconnect or quote reconnect. Um, what What is that? In Portland, I assume, I, I looked at your schedule. You played them twice late in the season. Um, once they beat you by 17 on the end of a back to back and once was right before the all-star break so i suspect it was the the set was not the one right before the all-star break cuz everyone gets away maybe it was though but what 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 is that lunch about what does reconnect mean it was it was the game that he had like 49 points it was, i so i i, I want to say it was right before the all-star it was break. he had 50 he had 50 right before the 50. all-star break yeah 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 that was the game and um uh, you know, it, it's. I think that what I've learned about coaching is that it's um, it's really all of these conversations privately that you have with the guys that keeps everything going. You know, you present your vision, you know, for each day and and kind of in the big picture and all that stuff. And you you know you draw up your ATOs and you figure out your substitution patterns and all that. But coaching is really about the private conversations with your players during the course of the year. And uh, Kevin, uh, I felt like we needed to connect at that time. Uh, he just seemed to be drifting a little bit. And I think it, it hasn't always been easy for him, uh, even though he makes it look easy. It hasn't always been easy for him to blend into the team and blend his talents into the style that we've had here for many years. And, and so... Um, you know he's and and as you know with Kevin he's very vulnerable. I think it's one of his great qualities. Uh, he's a real human being. He's he's not like a machine. He's like he's he's vulnerable like we all are, and uh, which makes him coachable. Um, which may, means that there's going to be some ups and downs, and he's going to have some some angst here or there or some some issues. And and if you don't get that stuff out in the open, then. Uh, 
you're you're never going to get through it. And so I do that with all all my players, really. Uh, maybe not Clay, because Clay never requires any maintenance <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> but you know, Steph, Draymond, Andre, you know, I'm I'm constantly checking in with those guys, whether it's a lunch or dinner or phone call, text, whatever. And that was uh, I thought that was an important time heading into the All Star break, just to just to reconnect. Why did you think he was drifting? Just just to communicate. I mean, the NBA season is so busy. It's not like you have all these times to you know have dinners and chats and like, oh, he doesn't seem right. What what made you think he's he's drifting? I don't know. This was a different year. You know, last year was sort of the honeymoon, and, and um, it seemed like he was engaged all year last season. Where whereas this year, it was more of the fatigue of, you know, trying to do back-to-back. The whole team, you could feel it with the whole team where it was just harder. Everything was harder and um, everything was more difficult. And not only was that true as a group, but for individuals as well. I thought it was a harder season for Kevin. You know, maybe the um, novelty of joining a new team had worn off. Maybe, you know, he won the finals MVP and, we won a championship and, you know, then you're right back at it. And it's like, oh, wait, that, you know, now you got to climb the mountain again. Like it doesn't end. You know, I, I think there maybe there's a feeling with some guys that when you win a championship, that solves everything. Um, but it, it doesn't solve anything. It just gives you, it gives you a, a great moment and it gives you a ring and it gives you, you know, fodder for people's talk about your legacy or whatever, but life goes on and you've got to, you know, get back up and keep doing it. And um, it's one of the reasons it's been difficult to to do this four years in a row because it's, you know, you, you get to the top of the mountain, you got to start all over again. It's, uh, it's tough. I know that you, you guys will, will, you know, all the, the the stuff like the J.R. Smith box out as that happens in the season you will you will point that out to him in film sessions and and you know like you said he's a vulnerable guy he's a fascinating guy um, but, but I know that you guys won't go easy on him like you won't go easy on anybody no we 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 go at him in film session we go at, we go at everybody and and it's been established that um, you know we're not gonna we're not gonna be sensitive to to people's feelings we're just all we're trying to do is point out what we've got to do to get better. Um, and that's true for everybody. But again, you know, your voice gets old as a coach when you're harping on the same stuff. And this was a tough year for us in terms of the basics. I thought we, uh, we, we just had more mistakes this year than we have in the past. And, and I don't think the guys really wanted to hear me every day pointing them out, but that's my job. So (laughs) we had to get through that. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Uh, Um, you know, you, you, you've addressed this today again, um, I mean, you talked about the fatigue and and I don't want to say apathy, but just sort of the can we can we get to the playoffs already? You know, but you can't. You got to play the eighty two, and you know to some degree the habits you establish over those eighty two matter. Now you've established them years before, so maybe that matters less. But you just won it again, and you're going to have to play eighty two again next year. So what do you got? What 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 is next year going to be worse in terms of apathy and and wake me when the postseason starts? What do you have planned? Yeah. I don't know. What are you going to do? Have a beach volleyball tournament in L.A.? I don't even know. What can you do to keep these guys sort of fresh? That's actually a great idea, Zach. Hey, beach volleyball in L.A. Luke right. Walton. Luke Walton's legacy. Let me write that down. Yeah, that's right. Uh, no, I'm already thinking about that. We're going to have to be creative. I, I think we'll have a younger roster too. Um, I, you know, we had a lot of vets this year. I think you'll see more youth and energy to help us get through all that. I think there will be um, maybe a different sort of responsibility from our our top six guys. You know, the the four all stars plus Andre and Sean. That's the core of our team, and and we may have a couple of other vets returning, but. Uh, we may not. We don't know. It's it's going to be there's going to be a lot of roster change, which I think will help because young guys trying to fight for everything in their careers generally bring a lot of energy, and that that could be very important for us. But it also gives the core six uh, a new responsibility of being uh, mentors. Um, you know, the the mentoring was done by David West and Zaza this year. Those guys were great, but that's a role that you know maybe. For Draymond and KD and and these guys, maybe that 
yeah, helps them through next season, mentoring younger guys. I don't know, but we're going to have to be very creative and we're going to have to, you know, pace ourselves again and hopefully, you know, everything comes comes together again in the playoffs, but you never know. Yeah, I was going to ask you what different responsibilities meant. Like, what, is, what does mentoring mean on your team? I mean, I think we on the outside here mentoring and we think, well, all that really is 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 you know going up to a guy after a practice and say you know you didn't do this right or take it more seriously or you know eat right on a back to back. I don't know what what does it mean on your team. Well, it it means uh, all of that and more, but it also means sort of um, you know burying your own ego. Yeah, and um, you know Zaza I think was a great example of that. He started the first basically 55 60 games and then uh down the stretch we decided um we we knew we were going to have to go uh to a more mobile lineup that we were going to probably face houston and new orleans and teams that were going to test us uh, athletically and and so um once we went away from zaza you know that's really difficult on a guy Uh, but he handled it so well and he became a mentor on the bench and he talked to the guys during timeouts and during the game about what was happening and uh, couldn't have handled that any better. And, um, but it's, it's not an easy role. Andre has been doing that for years. He's taken every young wing who's come through here, whether it was Justin holiday, uh, Ian Clark, uh, Quinn cook, uh, you know, the Patrick McCall, he's taken all these guys and tried to teach them, about the league, about little tricks that they can use, how to prepare. Uh, Looney, actually, one of the reasons Looney had a great season this year, you know, he lost like 30 pounds last summer after uh, consecutive hip surgeries um, his first two years. I think he lost 25 pounds, and it, he credits Andre with uh, telling him, you got to change your diet, and he did. He comes in every day with you know, a f- food that, that he's, I don't know if he's prepared it or a chef or he's picked it up, but it's like, you know, as healthy as you can imagine. And uh, it helped him dramatically, and it's going to help him make millions of dollars, and, and he credits Andre. So you got to have guys like that built into your roster, and we've had a lot of that. We've been lucky. Do you think you know Sirius XM? Well, it's time to take a different look. And with packages for new subscriptions starting at as low as $5 a month plus fees and taxes, now is a great time to get a look at it all. It's commercial-free music plus sports, talk, comedy, more. Everything is on there. Visit SiriusXM.com slash get it now, all one word, get it now, to get offers for your car or on the go wherever you are. Get a great offer for as low as $5 a month plus fees and taxes at SiriusXM.com. Get it now. Offers are valid for new subscriptions only. How worried are you? were you that Andre was going to leave in free agency? Because that, that became a, a weirdly dramatic you know like like oh he's not meeting with the warriors he has houston on the map of he may, now he is going to meet with the warriors like you're in the process you know andre very well by now you're with bob like mm-hmm. uh, bob myers the gm how, how worried were you that he was actually going to do it i wasn't really worried at all about houston because um you know we knew what they could offer they only had their mid-level you know so you know, we're offering him whatever it was, 15, 16 million bucks a year. He's not going to take 8 million a year to leave, to leave a championship team. And uh, so I, I was never really that worried. I guess Sacramento was involved and they were offering him a big deal. And, and typical Andre, he, you know, decided to play a joke on Bob and me, got us, you know, got us on a conference call and told us he was going to go to Sacramento and we wished him well. And he was like, I got you suckers. I'm coming back. So, I, don't, I don't remember <laughs> hearing that story. No, that's probably the first time it's ever been told. But, uh, you know, now that we've won a title and we got it all in our rearview mirror, uh, that story can be told. And, and uh, But that's typical Andre. He's, uh, you know, he's got this sort of... He faked it? Yeah, he faked it. He faked it. He like, was he, was, he, was he good? Like, did, did, you, did your heart sink or did you know right away? Like, when I faked, like, sometimes I, I do things to make my wife angry. Like, I'll, I'll come home from the grocery store and pretend that I forgot the most important thing I was supposed to get. And she's like, you're just so bad at acting. Like, I can yeah. see right through. Did, yeah, did, yeah. You, did you believe it? <laughs> I bought it for a few seconds, but he gave it, he gave he it gave away it quickly. He just started laughing. He just said, no, nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, and it would have been shocking for him to leave this situation. So really the whole time I thought he was coming back, but he did bust me for about five seconds. 
the guy I'm glad you brought up as part of the core six, um, and he always gets overlooked because because he's you know pl- not as good as the other guys and doesn't play as many minutes. But um, I, I wonder what you've gotten to know and love about Sean Livingston in the years you've coached him because you know uh, I mean people remember, but with his injury that he suffered when he was younger and he was like a young Magic Johnson and all this, he's had just one of the most remarkable career arcs to being a three time champion. It feels like in big games he just never misses shots. And I've always told people, like, there are all these little bellwethers that I look at to see if a team is going to win or lose. or you know, And people talk about X factors. To, like, when he is, like, four for four, you just don't lose. Like, those eight points yeah. are you just never lose games. Well, I don't – tell us about Sean Livingston. Aside from the injury and the comeback story, what, did, what have you grown to know about him or what will you remember about coaching him? Just rock solid. Just one of the all-time great uh, teammates and one of the great people to coach. Uh, zero maintenance, um, so poised, so mature. Um, you know, you go back to 2015, you probably won't remember this, but, you know, I remember it because it was our first championship. But Clay, Clay Thompson fouled out and uh, in the fourth quarter of game six in Cleveland. And Sean played most of the fourth quarter and was tremendous. Had, like, put-back tip dunks, you know, little floaters, I think he must have had 12 or 14 points in that game, I'm thinking, and played a huge role in the clincher. And uh, he's yet another one of those high high IQ players that uh, LeBron was talking about during the series. You know, we we have a bunch of these guys, and Sean is as smart as, as anybody. Um, he just has, he's got, you know, a point guard's mind, but he's 6'8", with a, probably a 7-foot wingspan and knows where to be and knows how to play. So... Uh, we just have so many guys who can see the game, feel the game, and make plays. And to me, that's the true strength of our team. Obviously, the the stars deserve the credit. Uh, but you look over the years at all the, the guys who could make a play for us. Andrew Bogut, um, you know, David West, Andre, Sean, um, obviously Draymond. We know about that. But um, when you have multiple playmakers out there, uh, it's just so much easier to play the game when they, they can kind of figure it out together. And Sean was brilliant this whole series against Cleveland. Yeah, I feel like you guys were really um, executing at a high level in the finals. And, and one of the barometers for that, I don't even remember what, I believe it was game three. Um, you had a couple of possessions in that game where Andre and then Draymond passed up wide open threes and reset the possession and when that happens it for a fleeting second it feels like the defense is won because that's that's mm-hmm. what they that's what the and and but they pivoted so fast into the next play that the defense was still kind of scrambling and the next play turned into one was a clay three when he cut along the baseline to the left corner and Andre hit him with a behind the back pass right in front of your yep. bench and one was Draymond, it was it was that shorting play you ran like five times in a row with Bell rolling and Draymond mm-hmm. Bell or, and Draymond uh, instead of driving pivoted into a dribble handoff with Steph and I don't remember what happened after that. It was just when you guys are humming like that, it makes what you say come to life because when you say oh we have so many playmakers blah blah, I see all these possessions when they don't shoot and I'm like well that's a dead possession but they really did turn it into. I, to me, I, I watch those plays, and I imagine that kind of thing probably makes Steve happier than almost any kind of play. Yeah, they do. They do, because those are the smart plays, and those are the winning plays. And uh, those are the kinds of things we ended up getting against Houston, you know, late in that series. A lot of those, uh, you remember Jordan Bell's, like, Statue of Liberty pass to, to Clay, where he went up like he was going to shoot it. and Actually, it was to Steph, dropped it behind his head for a jumper, went through his legs like Zaza does for another one. Um, but those are those are great plays, and they're hard to guard, obviously. And, uh, again, you know, one of the keys to our team, uh, I mentioned, was the playmaking, but it's also the fact that all of our stars can, can catch and shoot. You know, there are, um, a lot of stars in this league need the ball in their hands to generate their own shot, and it stops the offense. But, you know, all three of our big scorers are incredible catch-and-shoot guys, and uh, – you know they'll just race behind a play and get a little dribble handoff and pull up from three and you can't guard that. 
Speaking of David West, you already addressed this today, but you legit have no clue what he's talking about when he says, oh, there's going to be some stuff that comes out to sh- that shocks you. Like when, when a player says that, it's like, oh, my God, was there a fist fight? Was there like a coup? Right, was right. there – you you're just like, eh, maybe he's just saying something to mess with us. I don't know. Well, I mean, there were some things that uh, were difficult to deal with, um, but nothing like – um, earth shattering. So I don't know. He may have gone a little bit overboard, but uh, there were no fights. You know, there was just a lot of angst, and it was a long haul, and maybe a few things that happened that uh, maybe someday will come out. Uh, but uh, I, in a way, it'll be disappointing if it, uh, you know, because it's you know the way he phrased it, it made it sound like we had a huge brawl or something, and nothing like that happened. Well, you you might as well just. Tell them on this podcast now if they're going to come out eventually, Steve. You might as well just just tell the world now if you want. I don't think you, you know. Will. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I'll, just, um, I'll just go ahead and spill it all. We do have now two titles worth of evidence that David West, within the first hour of winning a championship, comes kind of unhinged in the best possible way. Like, but he'll never Great. top last year where he. I don't even remember what the hell he said. The Egyptians were involved, and you can't take your money with you. It was like unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, David is. Uh... He's got a lot of substance to him. He's got uh, a guy's got so much wisdom and knowledge in him, and he's a soft-spoken but incredibly strong, powerful man. And uh, you know, and I, I don't mean just physically. He's obviously an incredibly strong athlete, but I mean just as a as a human being. He's so strong-willed and strong-minded and smart and and curious about the world. He's always learning and and. Uh, so he's a really fun guy to talk to, and you guys don't see a whole lot uh, because he doesn't reveal a whole lot, but it comes out in celebration, apparently. <laughs> but he's a fascinating guy. Um, I have a very serious – this is a very serious matter to ask you about. There are rumors afoot, speaking of internal team secrets, that are very – they, they could break the chemistry of the Warriors. Um, there are rumors afoot that you nearly coached Game 4 of the finals without a dress shirt. Would you care to confirm this? Uh, well, there's some truth to the story, but there was never any concern about the dress shirt making its way from the Ritz Carlton uh, to the queue, given that it was it's about a quarter of a mile away. But yes, I I will confirm that I forgot to bring a dress shirt. And it, apparently, there was quite a chain of events, the chain of people handing it off. That did it. I mean, we got close to tip off. I was told, but again. The Cleveland is very small downtown. Yeah, there there was a chain of events. Um, it involves Mike Brown, who took great joy in the fact that I forgot my dress shirt. By the way, I, I refer to to Mike and me as Oscar and Felix for all the uh, old school TV fans of The Odd Couple. You remember the show? I do. Okay, you're not too young for that. Well, I mean, I'm too young to have watched it in like actual real time, but I'm not too. I, yeah. I'm old enough that I know what it is. Yeah, yeah. So Mike is Felix. That guy, every outfit is planned weeks in advance. He can't even imagine what would happen if he forgot a dress shirt. Like he would, it would ruin his life. Uh, whereas I do stuff like that all the time, and so I'm Oscar. And so I walk into the locker room, and and the reason it happened is I, you know, you usually have your whole suit with you when you show up, but in the playoffs, you know, I if for two games I bring one suit, you know, I just wear the same suit twice, easy that way. Nobody notices. Uh, no, nobody cares either. So, if you were a female you know, I, coach, it would be a story. You realize that, right? It would That's be a story, but nobody cares. Yeah. You know, you just wear a nondescript suit, and nobody cares. So, but during the playoffs, you know, you just leave your stuff in the locker room. So it's kind of nice. You don't have to lug your your suit and your shoes. You know the the locker room's closed. So if you're if you're somewhere for you know four days and you don't have to lug that suit around, and you can just keep it hung up after game three and wear it for game four. Life's a lot easier. Um, but the flip side of that is your routine is a little, little changed. And uh, so I'm normally used to bring everything over in one bag, and I walked over. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm good. You know, the, 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 everything's over there. Well, there wasn't a dress shirt over there, so my routine was disrupted. So Mike ended up uh, facilitating the delivery uh, of my shirt through his girlfriend, and uh, it, it all worked out. I think you should be able to coach in a, in a jacket and, like, a stylish T-shirt. I think that should be okay. 
I don't well, think that... I mean, Nelly stopped. Didn't Nelly used to go mock turtleneck? Yeah, Rick Adelman. Rick Adelman no, would throw Dan, on the mock uh, turtleneck. Dan D'Antoni Dan for Marshall. He goes with the T-shirt underneath the, the sports coat. FIBA coaches wear, like, the track suit sometimes, I think. You know, I'm all right with that. Um, I, I, yeah, I would much prefer that. Um, la, your time is precious. We're going to let you go in a second. But what 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 do we have? For, we got the parade is tomorrow, right? The or, parade is tomorrow, yep. And uh, that's a really fun day, obviously. Uh, but parades in Oakland are special. Oakland's a pretty special place. It's uh it's hard to explain Oakland, uh, and we're the Bay's team. We're you know San Francisco, San Jose, everywhere around the Bay. We're you know we belong to the whole Bay, but this team has played in Oakland uh, for a long time. And Oakland is is one of the most diverse, funky cities you're ever going to see. And is that reflected in the parade? And you just you go around in that bus and you see people. It, it looks like a United Nations convention. It is awesome. People from all over, everywhere, every background, all cheering for you, all coming together in their their support and joy for the Warriors. Uh, it's a great day. This is a message that would really go over well when you guys visit the White House. By the way, just talk talking about. Oh yeah, them. yeah, that would yeah, that would yeah. They, I hope that he doesn't like. You know, I'm not even going to go down. There. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, this is your third parade. Are you, do you just do you, what, you're a veteran of the well, – this is your eighth parade, but it's your third as a coach. Um, I mean, is it just the hope everyone behaves themselves and doesn't say anything inflammatory in the speeches? Is that all we can hope for here, just get through the no, parade? No, no. You, you actually hope for the opposite. Ooh. Yeah, you hope for – like I, I think Nick Young may go full J.R. Smith this year. And um, I'm, I, I can't wait to see what he does. I'm going to say this. Did you notice Nick Young strutting down the court with like 10 <laughs> seconds to go? And like literally just broke out into a strut. Um, yeah. He's got a top J.R. Smith. Shirtless Nick Young is not good enough. This is Nick Young. He's, he, I don't know. I, I, I want antics. I want antics from Nick Young. I think, I think you'll get them. And uh, I will be very pleased. I, I love Nick Young. He's one of the happiest people I've ever met. He's always got a sp- smile on his face. And uh, I will say this. One of the things when, when you have a team that's won multiple championships, you pay close attention to the guys who are the first-timers. So Jordan hmm. Bell, Quinn Cook, Nick Young, you know, it's a different vibe when it's your first one. And uh, I couldn't stop smiling just looking at Nick and seeing how happy he was. And by the way, for a guy who's had punchline status for a lot of his career, JaVale McGee was not just, like, adequate. That guy was straight-up good in the last part of the finals. I mean, really, really good on both ends of the floor. That that was – hey, I'll, I'll eat the crow. I've made a lot of fun of JaVale. I, I did not think – that you would trust him to play serious minutes against a good team. You didn't trust him against Houston. You trusted him against Cleveland, and he was really, really good. I, 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 I'm that's that's a really great story. He was great, and and think of it this way: Has there ever been a guy who started the entire first round and then the last round, but hardly played in the middle two rounds? Like that doesn't happen. But part of it is a reflection of the modern NBA and and how versatile you have to be defensively and. You have to find different matchups, and then part of it is about Javel and and how well he did in terms of staying ready and and uh, keeping his conditioning. And but it just happened to be you know, a good matchup for him. The way Cleveland was switching, you know, you can take advantage of of Javel slipping, and you know he's such a great finisher at the rim. And I thought he was fantastic. Uh, any any summer plans? Any plans? Do you get any downtime? Any vacation plans? Can you get the whole Kerr family together at this point? Your kids we are, are finally doing that. Yeah, yeah, we're finally doing that in July. It's our first like real family vacation in many many years. So we're all gonna uh, go to Europe in July. We're pretty excited. We're going to the Greek islands. Wow, that's great. I've heard yeah. the Greek islands are are fantastic. I have never been, but. Yeah. Uh, Enjoy. This is after free agency, I would assume, right? After summer league, I guess. Yeah. yeah okay. After summer league, so I'm pretty fired up. It's gonna be awesome. All right, coach. Um, it's been it's been a long season. You guys made it a little bit shorter with the sweep, the low family, and all the other media. Thanks you. Um, I will see you, I, I guess, in Vegas. And uh, congratulations on a third NBA title as coach of the Warriors. Thanks, Zach. See you in Vegas. <laughs>